Okay, we are going to continue with our recombinant DNA technology lecture and we are going to focus on the plasmid. Now the plasmid, as you can see, is a circular, double-stranded DNA, piece of DNA that is very commonly found in bacterial cells. And plasmids tend to carry antibiotic resistance genes. So this is one of the mechanisms that bacteria use to transfer antibiotic resistance from one bacterial cell to another bacterial cell by passing on these plasmids. Now the thing about plasmids is that they are, are autonomously replicating. So they can replicate themselves outside of a chromosome. So that's why plasmids make great vectors in recombinant um, uh, biology. So you have these plasmids, these circular plasmids, inside of a bacterial cell. And these plasmids can move outside of the bacterial cell. When bacteria lice, they can be released. And then a nearby bacterial cell can take up that plasmid. And now, if that plasmid has an antibiotic resistance gene in it, this bacteria is now resistant, as this one was resistant. So plasmids are a very nice um, tool in molecular biology. So restriction endonucleases. We already mentioned restriction endonucleases as the molecular scissors. So what restriction endonucleases do is they are enzymes that will come along DNA and whenever they see what's called a recognition sequence, they will cut at a specific site. So this table right here shows you what the recognition sequences are for some of the common restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes. So the enzyme BAMH1 will recognize the sequence GGATCC. The NOT1 restriction endonuclease will recognize a larger, a longer sequence, GCGGCCGC. So there are thousands of restriction enzymes, and each one will recognize a specific four base pair, like this one, usually five, six base pairs. Some of them can recognize slightly longer sequences. And whenever they see that specific string of nucleotides, they cut. Now the thing is, they don't cut randomly. They cut at a very specific site. So you can see here, we have ECO-R1. ECO-R1 recognizes the sequence G, A, A, T, T, C, and will always cut between the G and the A. So, so when you're designing um, your recombinant vectors, you want to make sure you're cutting with the right restriction enzyme. You would have to make sure that restriction sequence that recognition sequence is located in your DNA, the DNA of your ve uh, vector, as well as the DNA of your D the DNA that you're trying to put into the vector. And it should be in the right orientation. So it, there, it, it takes some finesse to design these experiments properly. So here we go again with our um, eco R1 and this is showing that in your double stranded DNA so let's say this enzyme is coming along this way and reading the DNA and another enzyme is coming along this way on the opposite strand and reading the DNA whenever it says sees G A A T T C it's going to cut between the G and the A now what this does is it will leave a specific 
pattern as it cuts. So you can have restriction enzymes like this here, BAMH1, that will leave what's called a five prime overhang. The way it cuts, so this is BMH1, it recognizes the sequence GGA, TCC, and it will always cut between the two Gs. So again, you're coming along, reading this ends, the enzymes coming along, sees this sequence GGA, TCC, and will cut between the two Gs. And what this does is it leaves an overhang, you can see the overhang, right here and this is a five prime overhang because you get some extra dangling nucleotides at the five prime end. There are other restriction endonucleases like KPN1. KPN1 recognizes the sequence GGG TACC and will always cut between the last two C's. This will leave a three prime overhang. And these types of restriction enzymes, whether it's a five prime overhang or a three prime overhang, are called sticky ends. So what they do is they leave these overhang overhangs, which is called a sticky end because you've got this excess nucleotide hanging out over here that will attach to the corresponding nucleotides. Now there are also restriction enzymes like SMA1 right here that generates blunt ends. So SMA1 is going to read DNA and it's going to recognize the sequence CCC GGG and it's always going to cut between the C and the G. And because it's cutting right in the center of these six nucleotides, it leaves a blunt end. There's no overhang, there's no dangling nucleotides here. So depending on what you're designing, what assay you're developing, what type of vector you're trying to generate recombinant DNA, you need to use the correct type of restriction enzyme that's going to make the appropriate type of end. Do you need a three prime overhang? Do you need a five prime overhang? Do you need a blunt end? So here's an example of the sticky ends. So your restriction enzyme is cutting both strands of the DNA and it's leaving this dangling nucleotides if you cut your plasmid with the same restriction enzymes, you're leaving sticky ends on your plasmid. And this then, this piece of DNA can easily insert like a piece of Velcro into your plasmid site. And that is how you make recombinant DNA using a vector and a foreign piece of DNA. So again, ECOR1, ECOR1 is going to recognize the sequence GAA, TTC, and cut between the G and the A. It's gonna leave these nice overhangs, leave this nice sticky end. And these sticky ends, so you have here the C, T, T, a, A hanging out over here and if there's another piece of DNA in close proximity that has the appropriate um, complementary sequences and the correct overhang it is going to combine. So we have A A T T and it would just combine together and generate recombinant DNA. So again, just another example. You have two molecules, molecule A and molecule B. Let's just say molecule A is your plasmid DNA and molecule B is your um, 
DNA of interest, DNA from, let's say, a mouse. And you want to make recombinant DNA. You want to put a mouse gene inside of the plasmid. So you are going to digest your plasmid with the restriction enzyme BAMH1. BAMH1 is going to recognize GGA TCC and it is always going to cut between the two G's. So it's going to leave your sticky ends on both your mouse DNA and your plasmid DNA. And when you put the now the plasmid DNA with the sticky ends and your mouse gene with those same sticky ends, you add in the enzyme ligase, and if you guys remember from an earlier lecture, ligase is molecular glue. The ligase, when you add it into this reaction, is going to glue these sticky ends together and generate your recombinant product. And in this case, it's your plasmid that contains a gene from a mouse. So here is an example with the actual plasmid. So you have your circular double-stranded plasmid here. EcoR1 is being used to cut between the G and the A at the recognition sequence GAATTC in both strands of your plasmid, generating sticky ends. You have your DNA that you want to put in. So let's say we have um, some gene from, uh, let's say, a um, horsefly that generates um, a, a specific phenotype that you want to study. So you take, cut that, you um, extract your genomic DNA from your horsefly, you would amplify using usually a PCR type of reaction to amplify this gene. When you get a lot of copies of that gene, you add in your EcoR1 enzyme and incubate it. It's going to cut at the right restriction um, recognition sequence. You're then going to get your cut gene from your horsefly and you are going to add a ligase and you are going to then seal up your DNA, your gene from your horsefly into your plasmid and end up with recombinant DNA with plasmid DNA mixed with a gene from a horsefly that you can then study. Now we're gonna continue by talking about how you are gonna then use this recombinant DNA and clone it, make many copies of it.